Greetings. It is good to be with you all uh, week two as we look at our um, information for Family Matters, week two, Family in the New Testament. Uh, before we get started, I do want to uh, want to pray for us, and then we'll jump uh, right into our slides and our information for this week. Uh, I'm going to read for us uh, Psalms chapter 93 uh, right now, and then just kind of pray through that, and then we'll jump into, um, yeah, jump into, our, jump into our studies. Uh, The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He has put on strength as his belt. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. Mightier than the thunders of many waters. Mightier than the waves of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your decrees are very trustworthy. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forever. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we know that you reign and in, and you're robed in majesty, uh, Father. We trust you. Uh, we trust your word. We trust the fact, Lord, that you have set uh, the world into motion, that you are meticulously involved in each aspect of of all that you have created, Lord. And so we trust in, we rest in you. Lord, we know that your decrees are trustworthy. We know that we can trust the scripture and trust the text that we're about to uh, spend time reading through and discussing, Lord. And Father, I'm, I'm, I'm asking right now that I will be used as a tool, as a vessel uh, to make plain, to make clear uh, life of individuals, life of families uh, in the New Testament, Lord. Uh, give me strength, give me your grace. God, and set my heart ablaze and on fire even now as I, as I deal with the word, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Well, it's good to be again uh, with, uh, with you all today. I want to do a quick, uh, a very, very quick review, and then we'll jump into to our discussion for, uh, for the New Testament this week, Family Matters, uh, week two. Again, the desire was to... Uh, kind of a scope and sequence for where we're going with this. And I have made a little bit of, uh, of I caught a little bit of an audible, even as I was finalizing uh, this and just kind of, re- you know, reading through the notes and stuff again. So next week will be a little bit different. I think next week I said that we would discuss, uh, you know, families worldwide, taking a look at what uh, perspectives of, of, of families um, worldwide. And we won't do that next week. I think I'm going to save that for week six or our, our May not even get to it at all. We'll have to see. So when we finish up our discussion this, uh, this week in my lecture time this week, we're going to look next week at, uh, at the church as family or church family. So again, uh, the, 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 the whole purpose of this few-week overview is not to deal with each aspect of the family culture in the New Testament, uh, in, during the Old Testament times, as well as during the New Testament times, but just an overview looking at some families that were mentioned in Scripture in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament is where we'll spend our time this week. And I did bring a couple of books uh, to show, show us this week. So uh, last week I mentioned, I think, uh, a couple of texts, uh, the Bible background commentary, New Testament by Craig Keener, that I think this is the New Testament version uh, of this book, which gives, uh, I think, uh, really, really good information on what took place, the cultural aspect of what was taking place in, e- in each of the Scriptures. And then... Uh, I was asked to show, you know, God, Revelation, and Authority, God Who Stands and Stays uh, by Carl F.H. Henry. Again, this is like a six-volume set, and uh, that's the one that it took me so many years to read uh, to read through. Uh, not because he's not a great writer, because I'm just a little bit of a slow reader. Okay, so um, just, just thinking through, we, last week we talked about the, uh, I, uh, the, the disorder in some of the Old Testament families, starting with with, uh, with, with, uh, with the disobedience of Adam and Eve a- a- because God was their father and they're o- immediately, not immediately, but they were very quickly disobedient to, uh, to the word of the Lord. And then from there, just moving forward, we saw the depravity of the human heart dealing with, you know, Cain and Abel and the murder that took place there and, and Jacob and Esau and the conniving and, and, of, and, of, uh, and uh, Rebecca and Isaac and, and, all the, and all the dismantling and all the, the fracturedness that comes with sin, uh, even in, in those families. And then we talked a little bit about uh, maybe, maybe some helpful examples in the New Testament, how, how Noah uh, found favor 
with the Lord and how beautiful uh, that was for him to find favor. Again, that was, that was the grace and the love of the Lord bestowed upon him. And the Lord looked and chose him because of his own grace and his own mercy. And then I mentioned last week Job as a model, and I, and I realized that I skipped over a slide uh, last week because I mentioned Job and how he had consecrated and made sacrifices for his children. And we even talked a little bit about Job and his own characteristics last week. But then I, I, I skipped over the fact that, yeah, his, his wife was, um, I mean, just yeah, frank, frankly speaking, uh, his wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? You know, curse God and die. Uh, that's because she was a little bit bothered by the fact that, that Job was holding on to his integrity, holding on to his, the faith that he had for for the Lord. And so even, even in the midst of Job often sacrifices, serving the Lord, uh, being, uh, you know, having, dealing with physical illnesses and the loss of, uh, of, of everything and everybody that he knew, uh, again, early on in, in Job, you see the words from his, uh, words from his bride were, were not very helpful and supportive. And so I, I think I ended last week saying hey, all, all the fractionness, all the brokenness in the Old Testament scripture should make us long for Jesus Christ, the coming of Christ to make, to make all things new. And this is not a knock on the families in the Old Testament, nor will it be a knock on families in the New Testament. Uh, but I do hope uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of an encouragement to us, particularly as we look at, at our study over the next few weeks, that hey, there, there were no picture-perfect families in the Bible. And sometimes we hear through through uh, mainstream media. We may have even heard from uh, some uh, fr- from from people, uh, um, good meaning folks, tell us what our family dynamics should and should not look like. And some of them are helpful, but I think just taking a survey of, of the scripture lets us know that hey, yeah, they're, 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 because of the brokenness and fallenness of human being of, of of all of us that that sometimes you know mess happens in in our families. And a few resources that I wanted to, I think I've already shown, I've shown you two, but I wanted to mention for this week that I could not recall the name of last week, I think each by, by Dr. John Piper. You see them here. One is Ruth Under the Wings of God, and that is, and that is a poem, and you can, you can pick that up. Uh, I think it, it should be free, at least today or yesterday or last week it was free. And, um, and then as well as A Sweet and Bitter Providence, Sex, Race, and the Sovereignty of God, those are two books that deal with, with the book of Ruth uh, in particular. So let's, uh, let's, let's hurry along now as we make sense of, and I'll kind of follow the same format that I did last week, uh, looking at, I started off li- looking at God as Father. So if you turn with me in your Bible, and we'll spend uh, a lot of time in, in the Gospels uh, today, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 12. And the whole idea of God being Father in the Old Testament is still the same in the New Testament. Remember, so the God of the Bible is the God of the Bible. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament, although at times he reveals himself a little bit differently. He is the God of the Bible, is simply God of, of the Bible. And what's, uh, what's amazing about God uh, of the Bible is uh, he is so kind to reveal himself to us, right, to show us who he is yet we don't know how much of himself he has not revealed, and uh, which just blows my mind when I begin to think about his sovereignty and just how, how strong and how mighty he is and how, you know, how being robed in majesty, like how, how much more of, of the Lord is there to see and we get to spend time for forever with him. Um, just being amazed, simply amazed. At who he is. So God is the Father. God is our Father. And so, and so we look at the, the model prayer, and may you say in your Bible, the, the Lord's Prayer. I'll read through that. And the, the first few verses we see this. This is Jesus Christ talking with his disciples. He says, Pray, pray then like this. Verse 9 says, Our Father in heaven. And those those first four words, they're, they're you know, uh, they're, they're messages out there where, where, where some thoughtful pastors I've dealt with just walking through the Lord's Prayer, but I think it's good for us to see that Jesus Christ refers to the Heavenly Father, His Heavenly Father, and we should refer to the Heavenly Father as, again, our Father, our Father. We belong to Him. He belongs to us. We are His. He is ours, our Father in heaven. 
And, and I'll just, I'll read through the rest of that, but don't, I won't, I won't deal with the rest of, of, of the prayer. But he goes on to say, hallowed be your name, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have forgiven our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. But the emphasis there is as we think about, as we think about family, we think about God being our heavenly father, we approach our heavenly father. This is an, just an example of how he shall be esteemed, should be esteemed, even in the life of, of our prayers. Uh, we can hurry along now. Uh, you can look at Philippians chapter 4, uh, verse 20. Uh, he is the father of, of glory. He is the father of glory. So, so Paul wrote the book of Philippians to the church at Philippi, and it's filled with uh, encouragement to that church. And Paul, again, refers to God as the father of of glory, right? You can, you can go to James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good gift, every good gift comes from, from the Father. Every good gift comes from the Father. So we see, these, we see these references, we see these continued references both in the gospel in Paul's letters as well as a letter written by, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the, the book written by James. We see these references to God as God our Father. God our Father, and he exemplifies every characteristics that fathers should have. And fathers, as they lead homes, uh, should seek to live godly lives. And that was one of the points that we made last week. The greatest gift we get is Jesus Christ. And, and I was reading an article, uh, it was some time ago, by, by Tabidi. And he has five reasons for the father silently Five reasons the father silently said no to the son in the Garden of Gethsemane. I won't read this whole whole piece right now, but uh, but Tabidi's whole emphasis on this on this point is: Hey, listen, it's a beauty that God, our Father, gave us Jesus Christ as 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 a gift, right? And we get the free gift of salvation through the shed blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And you know what? I I will read this entire thing. Here 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 is what he says just in a in a in a summary. And if you go, you can find the article out there on on the uh, the TGC's website. He says we're not to think no answer was given on that amazing night in Gethsemane. Neither are we to think that the father's silence no indicated purposeful less neglect, as though God the Father were a divine deadbeat dad. We're to understand that the only perfect father found occasion to deny the only perfect son because such denial achieved the only perfect ends, a perfectly qualified high priesthood, reconciliation through the only God-man, mediator, loving atonement for the sins of men, the vindication of the Father's righteousness, and the ever redounding glory of the Father in the Son and the Son in the Father. Gethsemane's silence, silent answer was eternally be heard in the loud joyous praise of the universe and for that we say amen amen that that's how that's how much the father loved us that's how much the son loved us so now let's 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 hurry along now to look at this again some snapshots we'll do a quick history uh this is a a quick survey many of the things many many of the uh characteristics found in the old testament times as it relates to family uh, would have been very, very present in New Testament times. We, we must remember that uh, New Testament living people would have been reading the Old Testament and getting their, getting their cues on how to live from the Old Testament writings. And I think I have a, a point here somewhere in one of these slides that says something like that. A family was much more than a group of people living under the same roof. Sometimes our families are simply that, right? It's, it's a bunch of people who... Um, They live on the same roof. They don't do very many things together. They don't have families together. Many times people don't worship together. They don't work together. They don't do anything together. Simply a bunch of people living under the same roof. And again, the family in the New Testament was much more than that. New Testament families, uh, like like, uh, the Old Testament families, they they were deemed necessary to conduct business, to take care of one another, and, and, um, and to take care of whatever business the family uh, could have earned or whatever industry that they would have worked in together. Again, it could have been multiple generations of families living in a home, and there's some example, examples of that that I think we'll hit here in a little bit. 
And I, I want to just kind of remind us that, hey, the fifth commandment to honor your father and mother was recognized and respected amongst uh, New Testament uh, Bible-believing folks or, or you know, Bible-believing folks. And, and it, this, this is good. This is an important point here for us to think through. It. Our fam- our marriages were arranged. We're going to talk about Mary and Joseph here in a little bit. And um, in the Western world today, in our society, there, there are no more arranged uh, marriages. So that's, again, quick bird's eye view. Now let's look at some text. Now let's take a, a quick moment to look at some of the, some of the families uh, mentioned in the New Testament. And again, the emphasis here is to think, hey, um, it begin to look through the scripture. A lot of times I think I've read the Bible, even more, you know, before thinking through, um, thinking through uh, these texts and, and, and these examples in scripture as families. I've seen them sometimes as not necessarily look, looking at Mary and Joseph as a family unit, or if we're going to talk about Mary and, and Martha here in a little bit, not necessarily thinking through them as a family unit. So now I think that the lens that I want to look through is like how were they living and functioning and seeing these people as husband and wife and sisters and brothers uh, and, and the like. So Mary, Mary found favor. I know we read that before, right? right? We hear that Mary found favor with God, much like Noah found favor with God. So turn with me in your Bible to Luke chapter 1. We'll go to Luke chapter 1, and we'll just kind of we'll read through the first few verses. And again, I think I told you we'll spend some time uh, in, some of the, um, in some of the Gospels today. So Luke chapter 1, verse 28 to 30, and the Bible reads as follows. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he came to her. I'll start at verse 26. May just make, put this in this context a little bit more. So we'll, 28 is here, but we'll go, we'll start at verse 26. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. We'll talk about Joseph here in a minute, of the house of David, which is very, very important. Um, and the virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, O favorite one, the Lord is with you. So two things that are pointed out here in, uh, in verse 28. One, she's favored. We read that language because that's how this, the, the, the holy text referred to Noah. And it said, oh, favor one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor again, found favor with, with God. And so this whole connection, again, we were kind of, kind of uh, some mirroring here taking place. And now, now, now Mary's right response. So, so what is our right response when we, uh, when we are, when we are given favor, when the, when the Lord, when the Lord is with us, when God, when the Lord blesses us with whatever it is he decides to give us that, that is, uh, that is always good for us. It should be a heart and a response of praise. And so Mary's, if, if you fast forward a little bit to verse 46, you will see the Mary's song of praise. So her response, when she's heard this news, she, she visits Elizabeth. They're having these conversations. Babies are, are jumping in their wombs, and she responds with, with praise. And so think now for a moment. You go see a cousin, and you hang out with them. You have good news to share with them, and, you, you know, you just shout for joy, right? So, again, look through this whole situation now as, as a family or a family, as a family situation. Now, let, let's talk just for a moment about Joseph. Um, Matthew chapter 1, uh, verses 18 and 19, refer to Joseph as being, as being just, as being, as being righteous before the Lord. Now, I have three words here, stoning, embarrassment, and shame, because uh, Joseph, he, he says, listen, remember, we, we, can, we can go back to, to Ruth and the conversation with Ruth, Ruth and Boaz. One of the words... Um, uh, we, Boaz was discreet in the way that, that he dealt with Ruth. She came, she laid at his feet. He's like, hey, get up, get out of here. You know, I, you, you don't need to be seen here. So, you know, you know get, get out of here. I, you know, I, I, nobody else needs to know that you were here tonight. I, you know, thank you, you know, but, but I need you to go now. And likewise, we see the, the same behavior, the, 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 this, this justice right behavior being modeled by Joseph. Now, Biblically, you know, in, in you know, the law, he had the right, right? Multiple things could happen to Mary. She could have been stoned to death uh, for, 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 uh, for, for being pregnant, you know, and, and it wasn't his, right? They, they were betrothed. They were, they, were, they were set to be married. They were engaged. Uh, just the, and, and he covered her from embarrassment and shame. 
So, so it says he's going to, he's going to quietly uh, dismiss her. He's going to quietly divorce her. So now just, just thinking now through, through the dynamics of who the Lord chose uh, even to be, even to care over our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He chose a just and a righteous man. Now, Joseph is not mentioned much in the Bible. He's not mentioned much at all in the text. But here's some things that I think we need to keep in mind, even as we think through Joseph being absent. And I'll make a point here again in a minute. Uh, but, but, but Joseph, he, he would have, he heard from the angels. He would have been present during birth. He was present during his lifetime. And he would have witnessed his ministry. He would have witnessed the ministry and the miraculous works of Jesus Christ. So I, I sell that to say this. The silence or the fact that we do not hear from much from Joseph does not speak to, I think, him being an apathetic or a distant father. I think what we need to know about him is that he was just and that he was righteous. Again, same language used. And we think about Noah, when the Lord looks down, he says, all these people are, are at, you know, er, er, the, every inclination of their heart in, in, in Genesis chapter six is evil. But I look and I find Noah, a righteous man who is, who walks with God. And so we have Joseph here who is seen as a just and a righteous man. And I don't have time to fill in completely this text, but there's another great resource out there uh, by Dr. Jonathan Pennington. He has a sermon that can be found on, on Southern Seminary's website. And the name of the, the title of the sermon is The Revelation of Mercy. And, he, and he, he goes into a little bit more detail with some of the characteristics of Joseph. And he also has some writings and a commentary that deals, with, uh, deal, uh, deals a lot with Joseph. So we, just a snapshot at, at the family of, of, of Jesus. We'll talk more next week about Jesus' brothers and his sisters when we look at our own uh, church, as we look at church and church family. So here are some other examples of just hoping that we can begin to think through families in the Bible as we go through this quick overview. So then we have a family mentioned. If you would, turn with me to Acts chapter 10, and I'll go there. You go to Acts chapter 10. Maybe you've read this story before. Hopefully you've heard the story before. If not, you're going to hear it today. And we have a story here of Cornelius. So Acts chapter 10, verse, I'll start with verse 1. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. Now, here, here are some descriptions of, of, uh, of Cornelius and what we ought to be striving to and how men, we ought to be trying to lead our families, women, uh, particularly if, if, if you're single, you ought to be trying to, to, uh, to lead yourself. Young men, if you're single, you ought to be leading yourself. And here, here, here's, what, here's what life looks like for, for us. A devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. And I left off, I need to add in there that fourth point, pray continually. I think it's in one of the applications I have on our last slide, and I omitted it here, but he prayed to the Lord continually. So we think about this family. We think about this family. He, the, the father was devoted. They feared God with their whole, their whole household. They prayed continuously. So a few takeaways that we can get, even from looking at Cornelius and his family. One is, hey, are we devoted? I think that's a question we'll deal with a little bit later on. Do we have a healthy fear of the Lord, understanding his power and his authority? And are we driving, are we encouraging the households that we're overseeing to fear the Lord? Are we giving generously? He gave alms. Are we giving? Are we giving what we can't afford to give generously? Not begrudgingly. Are we giving generously what we have? And then are we praying continually with our families? So that's a snapshot of Cornelius and, and his family. Uh, another family that, that is mentioned here, no, no, no mother and father mentioned for, for Mary and Martha and, and Lazarus. But again, so in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. And there's been a lot of dealings with, uh, with Mary and Martha. I don't, I don't know how many books are written on Mary and Martha. Should you be like Mary? Should you be like Martha? Don't be like Mary. Don't be like Martha. You know, there, there's a ton out there. On, on, uh, for, uh, for, for you to pick up and, 
um, maybe next week, if, 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 I, if, I, if I can remember, uh, the next time we get together, I'll try to think of, and I'll ask, uh, ask her, probably the most helpful resource on dealing uh, with, with Mary and with Martha. But if you go to Luke chapter 10, verse 30, 38 to 42, it simply says, Now as they were on their, on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called uh, Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teachings. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Now, here's the deal. So we talked about some, some brother conflicts with, uh, with Jacob and Esau and Cain and Abel. And here, right, uh, right here in the New Testament is this conflict uh, between sisters. They want to sit at the feet of Jesus. The other is busy, is busy serving, getting things together. And the Lord has his, his response is always fitting, right? Um, and then he's, he, she goes on and hey, look, tell her then to help me. Tell her, get over here and help me, right? So I, I, I would only suspect that, uh, yeah, so yeah I, I, listen, I, I, have, I have an older brother. I've mentioned this before, older brother uh, and an older sister and a younger brother. And I, I knew what I could do to get under the nerves, to get under the, I'm sorry, get under the skin of, of my siblings, right? So I would suspect that this little family friction is taking place uh, that, uh, that, that they, they may be fully aware that they, they may be bothering one another at this point but because they're, they're human beings. They're, they're living human beings. But, but Jesus, with his, his fitting and, and timely response, says, But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. So, again, a little bit of a frictions here between, between siblings and the Lord has the answer. Much like in Luke chapter 4, the Lord has a fitting response. Every time Satan says something to him, Satan throws to ask him to do something, the Lord responds with the word. And again, he's just, he, he's just constantly regurgitating the word because he is, he is the word. All right, so, let, and, and, and I attack Lazarus on here as well because he, he was their sibling. And if you go to John chapter 11, verses 1 to 27, we do not have time to read, uh, to read that, uh, that whole passage this morning, but read it uh, for homework. And um, if you have questions, comments, maybe we can discuss them a little bit later on. But, uh, but, but check that out. Read, read through how, again, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were, were a group of siblings living in the Old Testament. It gives us just a snapshot of what could have been taking place in the family life of siblings during that time. Let's hurry along now to look at some other, other passages. Here are some things that I think are fitting for us to consider as we think about the importance of families uh, in the New Testament, families in the Old Testament, families in our own lives as we uh, move forward uh, next week and uh, looking at the church and then moving forward on how, how the Lord is, it has, uh, has directed us and some insight from the scripture on how we ought to live out our lives together, our lives together in the, in the local body and even within your local homes. But uh, I think it's important to just kind of take note here. First miracle performed, uh, Jesus' first public miracle, first recorded miracle in the scripture, John chapter 2, verse 11, is, is at a family event, at a, at a wedding. I don't, I don't, I don't know if there's, there's many more family events than like weddings and birthdays, but, but clearly Jesus finds himself at this wedding feast. And his mom says, hey, hey, son, we, 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 went, out of, we went out of wine. Uh, and she knew something about Jesus. Mary had pondered things about him, excuse me, in her heart. So she knew he could do something about it, right? And uh, so, so the first miracle, again, is performed at a wedding, at a family event, at a family function. So New Testament people were getting together. Likewise, we ought to get together. The feeding of the 5,000, if you, if you uh, read on now in John chapter 6, chapter 6 verse 10. Again, there were, there were families there. So if you, any commentary you read, you would will, will typically see hey, like 5,000 men were fed. But that typically doesn't include their wives and, and all of the children. Families would have been together, flocking together, following, listening to the word of the Lord. I do think this is important. I'm actually in Acts right now. If you go with me to Acts chapter 23, we, we see a mention of a, of a nephew here, which is good for us to think through um, as we think through the New Testament passage of Scripture. Go with me now to Acts chapter 23, verse 16 and 17. And uh, there, there's a plot to kill, to kill Paul. 
And I think uh, there's some great resources again on Paul and his, and his journeys, his missionary journeys. And so here in Acts chapter 23, verses 16 on through verse 22, we hear this. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. So, and again, this is, this is his nephew. Uh, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man. Hey, take my nephew to the tribune for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul, the prisoner, called me and asked me to bring this young man to you. And he has he has something to tell you. The tribune took him by his hand and going aside, asked him privately, what is this you have to tell me? So so again, here 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 he is in Acts chapter 23, Paul using his nephew in order to get a message across or in order to pass a message, which shows that he would have been close enough to his sister, Paul, and would have been close enough to his nephew in order to, to bring him in, in order to send him with the message. So Paul was not divorced. Sometimes I think sometimes we may read Paul, we may, be, we may read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, we may read them as divorced from family life because many of what, much of what we know about them is connected to the miracles of Jesus Christ and their own writings and their own charges to us and how we ought to live and act and how we ought to defend ourselves as it relates to uh, the gospel. But sometimes I think we forget, hey, he was a living human being, a tent maker, making tents with a sister and a nephew that he called in order, in order to take a message uh, along for him. So, so just kind of see Paul as an uncle. Uncle Paul, so to speak, is how this young man would have referred, um, would have, would have referred, to, would have referred to Paul. So one, one final example, I'll actually back up a couple of chapters now, is just a, a, a dynamic husband, if I could say that, husband and wife duo with uh, Aquila and Priscilla, and they just labor together. Um, to, to train individuals. One, one person in which they trained was, was Apollos. Apollos was, of course, mentioned again in 1 Corinthians uh, uh, from Alexandria, uh, an intelligent scholar. You know, Paul mentions that about Apollos in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. But they even, again, a husband and wife duo, hey, pulling, pulling Apollos to the side and saying, hey, let us, let, let us further teach you uh, what it is you need to know about the Holy about, about the Holy Scripture. So again, and we, we've talked about singles and Pauls and married folks with Aquila and Priscilla's and nephews a little bit here and Mary and Joseph and Martha and Mary and Lazarus, uh, you know, uh, siblings. And so just for a moment, as we, as we, as we, so now what, I, what my desire for you to do is, particularly as we go forward in the next few weeks, as we are reading through the Old Testament and the New Testament, and this is not, it doesn't have to be at the forefront of your mind, but I think we can't be divorced from thinking through what was family like, life like for this person, for this person's life that I'm reading. Because you and I know that we're not divorced. The decisions that we make and the lives that we live, the things that we say, the places where we go, the places where we live and eat and work and, 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 uh, and, and visit, they're not divorced from our families and time with nieces and nephews and, and mothers and, and fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers and even our own, and even our own children. And so, so think, think through that. Uh, just, uh, again, family life in, in the New Testament. Some application points that I think are good and fitting for us. And now I just want to kind of pull some of the characteristics that we've read from the individuals already in the Scripture and see how we can apply them to our own lives. So number one is we ought to show mercy to one another. Where, where, where do I get this? I get this from, from Joseph when he was, he was showing mercy uh, to Mary. And now again, later on, an angel comes with him and says, hey, don't be alarmed, don't be afraid. But he had made this decision, uh, by the way, it's written in, in, in the text, far you know, before the angel, before the angel said anything to him. And so the question that I have to ask myself and that we need to ask one another, are we showing mercy where we need to show mercy? Are we, do we, will we have the capacity in order, in order to do that? And again, I think Dr. Pennington's work on, on, uh, on Joseph and even his sermons will be really, really helpful in this area. This, is, uh, this, this statement was present last week, and I suspect it will be present uh, every week we get together. Are we seeking to live a righteous life? Are we seeking to obey what the scripture is telling us to do and the scripture is telling us to say? Uh, so, again, going, looking at uh, Mary and Martha now, are we, are we sitting at the feet, so to speak? Are we listening to the word 
of the Lord? Are we devout? Are we devoted to the Lord? And do we have a healthy fear of God? And so though, these are the things that I think we ought to, to say. Are we living these things out? And I've, I have on the next slide three questions for us, and they're a little bit of what I've already uh, just said. Number two, I do want to, re- I'm sorry, I do want to revisit uh, number, uh, it says number three here. It should technically be number two. Um, am, I, am I habitually listening to the word of the Lord? Or am, I, am I we, I put we in there, uh, too busy as a family in order to do that? So are you making conscientious decisions in order to prioritize uh, time at church, time listening to the word, time reading your Bible? Are you prioritizing those things above and before uh, extracurricular activities, either your own extracurricular activities or the extracurricular activities of your spouse or your, or your children. That, that's something that we have to deal with, and we'll talk more about that in the coming weeks. And um, one thing that we cannot ignore, and the reason why I think I'm going to put off talking through um, families worldwide is because I think now as we talk, as we kind of end uh, the, the New Testament spill, and, we're look, and we, as, we, as we go forward, I want to end our time reading Matthew chapter 10, verse 34, and, verse 34 to 39. Matthew chapter 10, turn with you the scriptures in your, in, your, in your copy of the scripture. Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 to 39. And uh, we can think through how yeah, sometimes coming to know Christ has separated us from our biological family, and then the church family becomes the only family that we know or the only family that we have. And I know if we each had an opportunity to say, yeah, you know, I confess Christ, and I want to live a godly life, and, man, it really fractured my relationship with my brother. Or, yes, it fractured my relationship with my sister. Or, yes, it fractured my relationship with my, with, my, with my father or with my mother. And we have people in our local body who that is their story. I love Jesus, and now my family no longer loves me. I love the Lord, and I love his ways, and I want to walk with him, and my family no longer loves me. They no longer want to be with me. They no longer want to walk with me. So the importance of, of the body coming together is, is, is really, really important for us to think through and to work through. And so I want to take some time dealing with that uh, next week. But let's look now at Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 to 39, and um, hear, hear the words of the Lord. He says this. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a person's enemy will be those of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will, will find it. And, and I know, I have personal testimonies and stories of my own. I know that, that uh, loving the Lord and wanting to follow his commands has caused friction in my own family. And I know it has probably caused friction in many of you all's lives as well. But the Lord tells us we need to take up our cross. We need to follow him. Whoever loses his life for the sake of the Lord, he will surely find it. And, and, our, and I know our testimony as believers is, yeah, I, I left that old life. I threw the old man away. I'm now chasing after the Lord, and I found the life that is best for me, that is fitting for me. And so next week we'll look at, Hey, what, what it means for us, we'll spend a, a little bit of time reading through the scripture. If you would, read through the scripture, pray through it, uh, meditate on it over, over the next couple of days. And we'll spend a little bit of time next week looking, looking at this passage and then what it means for us. And, 
and the way we ought to be and the way we ought to seek to, to love one another as a church family. Um, I thank you for, for your time uh, today. I will close now with, a, with, with praying for us and I look forward to being you all the next time we get together. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, I, I pray that the time spent in this uh, quick bird's eye view, uh, snapshotting some of the families in, uh, in the New Testament will give us as readers of the scripture a lens in which to see uh, individuals that we read about in the Holy Scripture as, as living, breathing human beings with family connections. And Lord, I'm asking right now, Father, that you will drive our hearts closer together, Father, and, and that as we continue to take up our crosses daily, putting to death the deeds of our body, and for many of us, even leaving behind biological family and friends of old in order to follow you, Lord, that you will bless us all the more. And as your scripture has told us, you will give us so much more with our Christian and church family, Lord. Would you let us see, Lord, how this family uh, is our family. Lord, would you let us love one another with a deep and sincere and impassioned love for one another, all unto your glory. This prayer I ask in your son Christ Jesus' name. Amen.